Lisa from McMaster University to give uh, this colloquium today about uh, vortex, vortex filament and dynamics. Uh, and uh, uh, let us uh, uh, give the floor to Gabriella to say a few words about water. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. And my uh, sincere thanks to Walter for accepting to visit us today. It was very kind. We came after a week of uh, talks uh, in Maori, so I was already tired and had already a commitment to my train for the Northern Colloquium. But nonetheless, Superman said yes, and so to come to the Well, uh, just a few words about uh, Walter. Uh, after uh, after his uh, PhD at Milan, and in fact, uh, all the conventions for personal, we are sibling this way, because both Walter and I, Walter and I share the same super advisor. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I met Walter, uh, Walter was not there when I was in uh, Kuban. So we met, we met later. Oh, well, what can I say? Well, he's, uh, he has worked in um, the area of research. is PDE and uh, what's really the uh, dynamics, mechanics. Uh, I think probably uh, the most important work of uh, water concerns uh, water waves, so there's have some water waves, and uh, introduced actually uh, is the pioneer on utilize using KAN in a different dimensional Hamiltonian settings. So we know that in Italy we have exports sitting in the first row about applying the kind of Commodore, Carlos and Moser theory for dynamical systems, finite dimensional dynamical system in mathematical physics. And Walter was one of the first that showed how those very sort of really delicate techniques can apply in every dimension, then memory can be applied to study PDEs, nonlinear PDEs, periodic, almost periodic uh, solutions. And in fact, uh, because of that, he has now uh, collaborators and students from Italy. Uh, what was, can I say? Well, most of the uh, water uh, academic, a part of water academic life uh, was spent in Brown University. And I think because of the two body problem, if I mention this, this personal side, he moved in the year 2000 uh, with his wife at McMaster, and when he was appointed as a distinguished <coughs> professor. And just up to last year, he was director of the Field Institute. Uh, I guess this summarizes uh, what the contribution and what the uh, Statue as a mathematician, and today we will talk about vortex filament and dynamics. Thank you all. Gabriella, you're really too kind, and um, I have to say that I am appreciating <coughs> my status now as merely a professor because the amount of email is about one one hundred <laughs> previous years, and that's, that's very helpful. So my condolences, uh, Alessandro. <laughs> <laughs> Faces of the flood of email. Okay, this is um, a talk on vortex filament dynamics. It's not on water waves, but it is on some problems in fluid dynamics. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, no, I'm not at all Superman, and I have to tell you the secret is I haven't written my talk yet for Wednesday, so I'm a little nervous. <laughs> but, uh, I hope I can say something reasonable then. Uh, what's most important today is um, my collect. Just mention my collaborators. Uh, Carlos Garcia came from uh, UNAM in Mexico City, that's the top institute in, in Mexico, uh, and he showed me this problem. And then he uh, spent uh, more than two years with us, uh, and now he's back at UNAM as a, uh, as a, uh, as a professor. And Chi Bu Yang came from uh, Taiwan and uh, spent also some years with us and worked on this problem with me. And now he's uh, he's a resident of China, and I have to say that um, I should have another line, except we have no theorem yet, which is uh, Lydia Corsi. We're also working on the, the higher dimensional chloride case, but I'm going to report only on the periodic solution today. So um, my talk outline. I want to tell you what a vortex filament is. It's not completely clear what it should be, 
even for fluids, but I will tell you the setting. And then I'm going to show you that it's a partial differential equation that can be posed as a Hamiltonian system. So uh, I'm just handy, but here's the chair. In case you want to share. I want, to, I want to explain how sometimes uh, a partial differential equation, certainly one which, which involves time evolution, can be posed as a Hamiltonian system. Of course, phase space is, uh, is or is normally uh, infinite dimensional, infinite degrees of freedom. And also, uh, and then the question posed, why is that important? It could be just some detail. Uh, so it helps us in this, at least in this problem. Uh, I'm going to use the equation of vortex filaments in particular to, um, I'm talking about the third thing now, I'm going to use the vortex filaments in particular to pose if you, uh, and I have to forgive me saying really very simple things at that point, uh, I want to use it to pose natural questions for PDE in infinite dimension, in, in infinite dimension. so I'm hoping I'm going to make sense of that. Uh, I'm going to tell you how to do Nash-Moser and how it's related to Anderson localization, and then how to do Anderson localization. And both those two topics are basically orthogonal and very difficult topics. And so I'll just have one slide. That's the best thing to do in this kind of setting. And then, um, and then I'm going to tell you about problems that I don't know how to solve. So I'm going to pose the problem, at least formally, at a formal level, as um, a, a variational problem. And then to know, then to count multiple of solutions of variational problems, that very often helps to know the topology on which you're posing such solutions. It would be a constraint manifold. And then my question to you, and then my question to you, which shows my ignorance, what is a constraint manifold? And as I understand it, it's no question, at least in some cases. So let's go and really talk about uh, the problem. So before we give write an equation. Um, let me say that vortices show up all over the place at all sorts of levels. So it could be a, a tornado, and this is a, incredible because it's a tornado over the sea, so it pulls water up. And don't sail near there, but anyway, very, very dramatic. But if you fly an airplane, when you take off, when you land, and you sit in economy like me, near the wing, and if, if it's a little bit humid outside, you'll see condensation around vortex. Or if you go over the wing, usually from engine cowling. That's a little bit like that. If anybody smokes anymore, which I'm not sure they do, and you don't, and you're in a room where there's no motion, you can have vortex, helical vortices from smoke rings that ultimately develop instabilities. And then this is so large scale, smaller and smaller and smaller. This is um, superfluid helium, where they, where somehow they've organized so hydrogen bubbles form. On the, vortex, on, the, on, the super, on the vortex structures in the supercooled uh, fluid, and this is one millimeter, so these are m uh, max millimeter scale and very narrow <coughs> vortex filaments. In any case, I'd like to say they occur in many places. So, um, I'd first like to talk about vortex filaments in, a fluid, in fluid dynamics in a fluid which satisfies Euler's equation. So let me see, I'm going to take a little bit of chalk. I'm just writing blackboard so it's easier than just writing this thing. So here's three dimensions. Yeah, let's see, here's a coordinate system. So x1, x2, and then x3. And I'm going to draw this curve, which is an exactly vertical line. So that's uh, the curve. 0 for x1, 0 for x2, and s parameterized by, by the parameter s for x3. And I want to describe a flow which rotates around this line, which is uh, axisymmetric, independent of x3, and it merely rotates around x1 and x2. So it goes like that. And if I do so with a potential, with a stream function, with the potential which is a stream function, so I define C to be log of x1 squared plus x2 squared, which leads me to write a complex variable in each horizontal plane as z is equal to, excuse me, x1 plus i x2 is kind of useful. Then half log 
mod z squared is a stream function whose j times the gradient, this is j times the gradient, gives me a velocity field which turns around that exactly vertical line. And that's a solution of Euler's equation. It's a weak solution of Euler's equation, but it's a solution of Euler's equation nonetheless. It's incompressible. Its vorticity is zero everywhere except <coughs> on this curve. And the velocity on this curve is, well, infinity. Actually not defined, but it goes to infinity as you approach it. The magnet goes to infinity as you approach this. So it's a weak solution of Euler's equation, but it's a genuine weak solution. How do you know weak solutions? You test them with test functions, and that works in this setting. Okay? So there's one example. Okay, kind of trivial example, so I apologize for it. So there's one example. So let's better do another example. And it just sits there and, and fluid turns around it. But you can also do the following thing. You can take two vortex filaments. So I'm going to put it in its original configuration, where I can go like this at distance a upon 2, exactly vertical, and then on the negative part of the axis, I have to go out by minus a over 2, so this is minus a upon 2, and make another exactly vertical filament. <laughs> and, uh, and here they put the axes here and here. And then on the first one, I'm going to rotate this way, and on the second one, I'm going to rotate opposite that way, and uh, actually, I want to do the other way around, excuse me, because then I'm going to move it in the positive direction. And then the velocity field of this one pushes this one here. And the velocity field on this one pushes this one here. And they move. And they move to a later time. They're exactly vertical here and exactly vertical here. And that is a, is a dynamic, okay, it's simple. It's a da dynamic, weak, a genuine weak solution of three-dimensional Euler equation. And it's explicit when I wrote it down. And what happens if I didn't have opposite vorticity, but the same vorticity? Then, let's see how I want to do it. I want to go this way, and I want to have this way. So this is vorticity 1 and vorticity 1. And the flow on this moves this one there, and the flow on this moves this one here, and they go in a circle. And they go in a beautiful little circle, uh, and that's an exact solution exactly parallel. And the closer they are together, the faster they rotate. T over A squared, where A is their separation. The further they are, the less, the less rapidly they move. It's the same as here, the closer they are, the further their ballistic motion in a straight line, the closer they are, the faster they move. You can get them infinitely fast, almost, you know, any, any speed for any for very small separation, you get very large speed. Okay. But, you know, uh, this is, uh, in some sense, cheating because why am I drawing three-dimensional Euler? It's true that it's, it's important to be a genuine weak solution of 3D Euler, but really all the dynamics are points in a plane. So any, and, and that's an extremely well-developed subject, the, 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 the domain of uh, interaction of vortex points with log potentials in the plane. And you can do it on spheres and on other manifolds and including in space. And it has a certain relevance to fluid, fluid dynamics, and it's also developed, developed, developed in the engineering literature. So the question is, why do they have to be so perfectly vertical? And so this is a, an attempt, this is the first step, or some one of the first steps, at getting out of the exact parallel situation where you can have variation, genuine variation to three dimensions. Okay, well. Now we're running into mathematical difficulties because even the existence of a non-straight vortex filament is a question in fluid dynamics. I don't have this on the slide, but let me just describe what that should be. Well, a vortex filament is a concentration of vorticity on a curve. You can concentrate vorticity so you have unit vortex, vortex um, density, but still infinite velocities if that line is straight. But if I, if I make a curved line, the validity even of the, of the, um, of the uh, formal asymptotic expansion is in question in a Sapman wrote a whole book on that. So here's the, here's the challenge if for Euler's equation. Draw, take your favorite curve, but not straight. And take a tubular neighborhood of 
of, of uh, radius epsilon and make an initial data for an Euler flow which has zero vorticity outside, or whatever, but you can make it go to zero, so zero outside. And inside that tubular neighborhood, well, you need total vorticity to be, um, to, to, to be one, so you want the density to be one, so you need vorticity to be epsilon, one upon epsilon squared, because you're the, the surface area is epsilon squared. And, and then that, that's initial data, solve Euler. There's a time t, which depends on epsilon, so you have a solution. Now take epsilon to zero and show that t doesn't go to zero. Mm -hmm. And that's a serious problem, mm -hmm. which uh, remains open. So I'm going to leave exact Euler now, and I'm going to move to solutions of model equations for Euler. So I, what I want to study is, again, I'm going to do something like this. It's a little bit too simple to make exactly straight. I mean, the one the vortex lines that I drew you were not exactly straight. In fact, they were pretty curly. So what I want to say, how about if we're not too ambitious and just say, how about if one which is not too far from uh, from straight, but a little bit of a little bit of variation. And then because if I do that in a localized way and allow it to radiate to infinity, it can radiate. So what I'm going to do is look for two pi periodic. So this is the x3 axis. I'm going to cut it at 2 pi, or any length that you can scale. And I'm going to look for 2 pi periodic uh, solutions of a model for vortex dynamics, which retains its oscillation that is not perfectly straight. And it's a hard problem if there are large deviations from straight, from vertical. So I'm going to first look at the problem of perturbation from vertical. And I won't have anything about to say about the formula, but I will say something to say about the perturbation. OK. All that being said, let's get the setting correct. I'm going to give two vortex filaments with vortex strength plus one. I'm going to take a two pi periodic configuration in the x3 variables. And then I'm going to model, make a model of Euler equation, which is a formal model. And it was introduced in a paper by Klein, Maida, and Damodaran, 1989. <coughs> I forget the date now. I should have written it down. And let's not, uh, we could have two, but it, even the model works for n. So if we have n vortex filaments given by n space curves, which are essentially vertical, parameterized by vertical, and with small gradient of f, then there's an interaction equation which occurs. So the, 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 the location of the vortex, uh, it feels the influence of the other vortices, so you, the j feels the k not equal to j, by something which is given by the stream function that has the potential, which is a law. And if you differentiate the law, you get something like this. And then it has curvature, whose first approximation is a second derivative. And so this is a vortex filament which interacts with itself through something that looks like Schrodinger's equation, with a second derivative. And it interacts with the others by this, by this flow, which is generated as a law of flow of the other. Of course, it's not exactly a boiler, but it's not too far. Whoops, I should have pushed it. Ah, one moment. It tells me I have to talk that. OK, so that's the model. Let's set n equal 2. I'll just look at 2 internet. Why not? Now I'm going to describe the <coughs> filaments by their separation. And their separation at every s is a complex number. So I'm going to write an equation in complex numbers for their separation. That's the separation. W is a complex function. It's an x1 plus ix2. And they change in s, and they evolve in time. And in a frame, which now if I made them exactly straight, there's a natural frequency of rotation, which I showed you. Let's put that in a rotating frame. That frame will work with, with, with uh, angular frequency omega. And I want w to solve this. And that's the previous equation simplified to this setting. By the way, where does the center of vorticity? If I took, I'm taking the difference, and this is interacting, how about the sum? Well, half the sum, that's the center of vorticity. It just evolves. It's like the n-body problem. It's the center of mass coordinates, just evolves according to something other, and this is just according, just according to linear Schrodinger equation. So let's factor that out and look at the evolution of the difference. OK, here's another problem. So that's one problem. That's the problem we want to solve. But I learned very recently about this other problem. And let's see, recently means May, I think, just May, about this other problem. 
gross Piatowski equation. That's the equation solved by a, uh, a um, Bose-Einstein condensate. So it's uh, an equation not for u, a real vector field, but it's for u, a complex vector field, and it satisfies the dynamics of a, uh, of, uh, of a, um, of complex, uh, of, of complex evolution, a la Schrodinger equation, whose uh, stationary points are well known at, at, at Torbert point. So people in the audience, such as Gabriela, know and love this function. <laughs> and they work with it all the time. So I'm going to look at the dynamics of this function, at least a little bit, OK? I'm going to give it a confining potential. In, 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 in many cases, uh, analysts, at least of the stationary problem, make that confining potential a domain with, with boundary conditions. And OK, that would work, but also uh, maybe a wrong oscillator potential would work. And uh, there's uh, some physical quantities, density, momentum, free energy, vorticity. And um, if I, if I uh, look at solutions which have uh, zeros, then there are simple, the, 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 those could be extremely complicated, but there are simple examples, and those are uh, vortex filaments. So the zero, the set on which this uh, complex velocity potential is zero is a vortex filament. A definition, definition of vortex filament. And they can have an index. So if you look nearby, and they and that zero has a form of E V I D X D theta. To, uh, let's take theta to be the the, ang the, 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 the polar coordinate angle of a, of, a, of a horizontal plane. Then the zero will be given by F, which is which is a function that says applies an equation which depends on D, but at zero it gives the vortex filament. And, and D is the index. And it turns out, higher index vortex filaments repel. So if I just did this without a confining potential, a D index under dynamics would split into D many one index, and they would slowly spread apart. So the effect of the potential means that they stay there. So this is actually a study of the fine structure of a D index superfluid uh, vortex. And so, the ansatz describes the core. So a d index filament is unstable, but it's much more stable to have a d many one index solutions. So uh, I have to look for fj, j equals one to n. It's starting to sound familiar. These are the cores. The cores of these dynamics look like the filaments that I had in my two slides about ago. And they satisfy this fine structure evolution equation. And the only difference is there's a confining potential. So let's make the confining potential zero, except outside a, a, a box, and have all your filaments in the box, and then we come back to the previous equation. So it's the same equation, different setting. And the good thing about this setting, it doesn't have that open question. Actual, the actual um, validity of this description of the fine structure of a complex vortex potential was given by Contreras and, and Bob Girard uh, in the stationary case, and I just heard the talk about the time domain case from Bob Durer, actually it was the IHES in May, no, <coughs> June IHES talk, and they have the dynamic case as well. That's kind of cool. There's two settings, uh, variational problems and, fluid, and, and, and Euler fluid dynamics coming together and hitting the same spot. So that's the setting. Now let me, I point to the So it turns out that the equation that I've described are partial differential equations in S and evolution in time, and it turns out you can write them as a Hamiltonian system. Let's go back to two filaments, not n, just two, and we look at an equation for the difference. I'm writing the equation for the difference down. And then instead of my, the complex distance being w, that's the horizontal distance in each complex plane, I'm going to write it as a plus v, and v is the perturbation. So that says if v is small, it's uh, close to uh, small and small gradients that's close to vertical. And if I choose omega, the rotating of the frame, uh, one upon a squared, where a is the separation, the, the distance that the average force is separated, then it turns out that v is a stationary point with this. And it has a Hamiltonian. This is an energy for this. So if I write down the energy, it looks like with that separation a at rotation velocity omega, 
the Hamiltonian looks like that, the energy looks like this, and now V is a complex number, I'll write it as a real number, a real function of S and T plus mm -hmm. imaginary function of S, so X and Y are real, mm -hmm. so I'm decomposing V, and then it satisfies Ham Hamilton's canonical equation. Mm -hmm. That is, the Y variation of H is the X variation of X dependence of time, and the Y dependence of time is minus the X variation of H. It's a Hamiltonian system, and that's the energy. There's no identification of the position and momentum, that's just life. The dimensions are equivalent one to the other. Uh, the uh, symplectic structure changes sign if you change vorticity. Sign of vorticity. Okay, no problem. Do solutions exist? It's a PDE. The answer is yes, small H, small H1 solutions exist for all time. That's a, an older paper, an older result of this. this uh, well-known team of Kenny Ponson and Ponson Vega, mm -hmm. and there's a, and then there's a two uh, uh, French collaborators, Vanity and Danny Camille, who have written a, a number of papers, and the 2012 edition is survey, and they talk about mostly about the um, initial value problem, okay, and whether the solutions exist to the initial value problem. Okay, so that's a Hamiltonian PDE. I showed that it has a structure of. A, Hamiltonian system, despite the fact there's no identification of position momentum, there's still a symplectic form. And just one slide to say, what does it mean? Well, it's sort of an adaptable point of view. It's sort of a structural point of view. So flow, that is the solution process, is a flow in a phase space. The phase space is an appropriate, say, a Hilbert space. Let's give the let's say it's a Hilbert space so it has an inner product. And then I have to solve this equation, which is that t z dot is equal to j gradient z of h. Uh, my j is given as a Darboux, I've given the things in Darboux coordinates, so for us, for the moment at least, j is equal to, in x, y variables, zero identity minus identity zero, that's pretty common. Um, there's a symplectic form you, you can make, uh, you can represent, in, uh, uh, using the inner product and J, and uh, the flow is a mapping, starting with initial data and evaluating at a later time. And it might not be defined on all of your phase space, just because it's a PDE. But usually you say, I want to solve for initial subloops, variables, and then it's defined on the depth of your subspace. And the theorem, which uh, is a sort of a general fact, is the solution operator, that is the flow, preserves the Hamiltonian. It should be. And the proof is, if all of these make sense, the time derivative of the Hamiltonian is by the chain rule, the gradient of the Hamiltonian, inner product the variation, which is z dot. But z dot satisfies the equation, which is j grad h. But j is chosen to be anti-symmetric. That's a piece of being two form. And so therefore, this is zero. Okay, well that's all about that. Let me now let me now say what will we what do we anticipate about the solution? So I apologize for this bit because this is how we make our students brain dead. We separate variables and solve. So I'm gonna try to do this fast. So I mean it also makes our professors brain dead doing this stupid thing. So I'll do it as fast as I can, but there's a, a few lessons learned. Okay? So I want to linearize the equations. Uh, linearized equations around equi equilibrium solution. So remember V, the complex, not, the complex function, is zero as equilibrium, so I set X equal Y equals zero, and then I can find the, the linearized equations uh, actually just from the Hamiltonian. That's the pleasure of having Hamiltonian, just a quadratic part. Everything else is irrelevant because I'm linearizing. And the quadratic part is pretty easy to extract from the expressions I had before. Gradient of the derivative of x squared, the derivative of y squared, a half to be convenient, 2 over a squared, x squared itself is slightly unusual. It's not true. Sure. Linearized equation, just take the gradient, x dot is equal to y, uh, is the y gradient of h2, pretty clear that's minus yss, y dot is minus x gradient of h2, which gives me two components. What's the solution? Hey, it can be a homework set, oh, homework set for uh, maybe second years. Uh, let me Fourier transform, use Poncherelle to drive the Hamiltonian. Uh, what do the x hat k's and y hat k's satisfy? Uh, uh, uncoupled harmonic oscillators, 
with these frequencies, which you just get by looking at this is k squared plus 2 over a squared, and this is k squared. And those are the frequencies, and they oscillate. The, the higher the k is, the faster they oscillate. Uh, the solution operator is then given by cosines and sines. And you can also write it in Fourier transform. Here's your initial Fourier transform. E to the i k s is, a, is, a, is the oscillation in s. And the higher you, the faster there are oscillations s, the faster they, these oscillations rotate. So that's the oscillations of this, of this column. Angles, omega k t, are linear. If you start with an initial angle, and the later angle just moves linear. That's the feature. That's the feature. So later on time is the linear flow of the initial data. OK, simple. 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 Let me just state some elementary facts about that solution. Pretty simple. But here's some elementary facts. I again apologize for them being elementary, but I want them to be motivational statements. All solutions are periodic. Mm -hmm. Well, not necessarily periodic. They could. That frequency has roots and other algebraic things. It could be the two frequencies are non-commensurate. So it's quasi-periodic. In fact, if I have a my full, if I look at the data out in full uh, tangent space, if all frequency, frequencies could be active. And for most separations, all <coughs> there, there are no resonance relations between any of them. And it's almost periodic. There are infinitely many of rational independent frequencies in the solution. That's life. How do I calculate what the, what the solution does? Well, it's your job to give me the initial data. So you give me initial data. I take a Fourier transform. I look at the Fourier transform indices k such that um, the initial data Fourier transform <coughs> is non-zero for that k. Okay, And I make that a collection of capital K. Little k is the indices. The set of active indices is capital K. And then do the following thing. Look at the rational span of omega k. Then look at its rational dimension. That's the number. It's at least one if you don't have a zero solution. But most of the time, it's infinity. And it could be finite. I mean, you could put in finite number of wavelengths. It could be finite. That's the dimension of an orbit in phase space. So let me do the, of the linear equation. So let me do the following. I take initial data. I look at the linear flow, this is just separation, separation of variables, linear flow, but for all t, as a bunch of points in the Hilbert space, I take its closure, like an L2, L2, closure in L2, that's a torus. The dimension of the torus is given by this number. Could be periodic, that's m equal 1. Could be quasi-periodic, that's m, m bigger than 1, but, math, but people in the but mathematicians use quasi-periodic to say m is finite. That's, somehow the word, I don't know, I didn't choose it. And it's almost periodic if m is infinity, if, there's, if the frequency hull of the active frequencies is infinite. And for generic, oops, and for generic A, that's life, it's infinite. Interesting fact. So that's an elementary fact. Here's another elementary fact. Energy is conserved. Well, I just said energy is conserved for a Hamiltonian system. My linearized equations are a Hamiltonian system. It has energy, the quadratic part of the Hamiltonian. Its energy is conserved. Let's prove it. H2 is this. H2 and a solution. I plug in the flow here and here instead of just my initial conditions. And then, and then, I, and then I am going to show you that that is constant. This is equal to that. Well, we should already get a proof of that. But more is true. Because it's partly because of the structure of the symplectic nature of the equation. Not only is the Hamiltonian preserved, but each action variable is, is conserved. So let me prove it. I'm going to make i out of the Fourier transform variables. Here's x, y, x, k, y hat. I forgot the hats here. In fact, I hate hats, so I'm going to drop hats from now on. Too messy. But I weight i by this weight and that weight, and I form i, and then it turns out that d by dt of this combination, which occurs in this quadratic form, is zero without doing the sum. So every quantity, not just the sum is zero, but every quantity, which is every sum end, is zero. And hence, all sum oh, hence all sum of preserves. Let me prove you, prove that for you. Just do this calculation and this calculation with all those signs and cosines. It is zero. I, I, uh, I assure you. But what depends on on the action variable? 
the um, Hamiltonian, quadratic Hamiltonian, the energy. But you make all Sobolev norms out of the eyes. You just sum with weights. This each k to a power, to a even power, stands for derivatives in the, in the um, quadratic form. So the higher Sobolev norms, our Sobolev energy norm is 2r. And they're all exactly preserved. It's not approximate, it's not an estimate, it's not an a priori estimate. It is exactly preserved. Okay? And so now that motive, those two facts, the slide, the slide, previous slide and now, motivate a sequence of questions. And that's what I wanted to do. Whether, remember, all solutions of periodic, quasi periodic, or full set of frequencies, almost periodic, whether any solutions of the non linear problem are of that form. Any. It's a, turns out to be not completely easy. And it's certainly periodic is even small divisors, and almost periodic is open. I, I think I know <coughs> nine papers so far in the literature for the last 15 years that talk about almost periodic solutions for PDD. Okay, so it's not so trivial. And it's like a KM theory you put your phase phase of infinite dimension. Second question, the action variables will probably move. They're not so trivially stationary, constant. This is the adiabatic theory. But they could move very slowly. And that's like a normal form, that's averaging theory for PDEs. It's like a different normal form for PDE, or maybe even a Kuroshev stability for a PDE. And the question is, not only do they move very much, do they move up? Angles tend to move more. So that's why you ask about the actions themselves. And then the third question is, their cascade orbits, it's a little bit like Arnold diffusion, not really, but it's a little bit like it. And do some, so is there a uniform upper bound on behavior of solutions? I give energy this, or maybe shovel of energy this. Is it uniformly upper bound? Or are there some solutions, probably a very thin set, which escape any, any finite set? So are there cascade orbits, moving action variables from low k to high k? And uh, that's the question. Just motivated by those two, two, two things. I'm going to talk about, the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about one. So well, here's the result. This is Carlos, myself, and uh, Chibu. There exists a Cantor family of periodic standing wave solutions in the vortex filament equations near the uniform rotating solution. And here's the theorem which is in progress with Olivia and Carlos and myself. The first one will involve basically one wave number and will involve a standing wave of uh, which has a one principal spatial frequency. But the second theorem, I'm more precise, I'm giving more precision. You give me wave numbers k1 to km. So you say this is this this is the linear torus I would like to I would like to see or like to be near. If you give me those k, I'm gonna find I can't take <coughs> every separation, but I have to take almost all separations. Given uh, an element in, those, in that separation set, there's an epsilon such that epsilon, there's an epsilon naught such that epsilon size perturbations smaller than epsilon naught exist over a Cantor set of amplitudes. And the form is the linear solution plus perturbation, but the linear solution has a frequency which has drifted. So that's very much like a KM style statement where you have to allow the frequencies to drift because your action variables are drifting. And it's, um, by the way, finite number. And one of the questions is, can we do the, in the almost periodic case? We can add to that list and make a tenth paper on probably periodic, on almost periodic. But that's not on the horizon yet. Now, I've been holding back. It turns out that the equations I'm solving are more general than just a pair of vortices. If I, people in celestial mechanics talk about n-body uh, 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 problem solutions which are in central configurations. That is, every time is, is, uh, is what is called homothetic to every other time, but, the, but they can oscillate. So the same occurs for this class of, of, of near parallel vortex filaments. You can have a configuration of n many vortices, and you take any time slice, and it'll have the same geometry, in fact, the same 
the same configuration, but changed by a scale, and that scale will change in time, and the scale will change as you open down the column, because you're oscillating. Okay, so it's more complex than that, but it's still not actually a general solution. It's uh, some special vortex solution. Okay, let me uh, talk about the following. Um, uh, what goes into the, you know, what do you want to look for in a proof? And this is a bit of a generalization. I'm really, what is an invariant torus? Can I ask a question? Yes, of course, please. Because it's one of these conditions on x one zero. Yes. 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 And the worst a, the worst the smallest condition. Mm -hmm. And how big can the maximum x one zero be? Probably too small for real application. It's a KM type of environment. But yeah, it's a mathematical statement. It's positive. Already, I have to do it. <laughs> so F1 is generally small. And F1 zero is generally small. What is such a configuration? It's really you're taking a torus or a circle, even one dimension, and mapping it into phase space, and you would like that map, that, that, the image of that torus to be invariant under the flow. And a little bit more than that, you would like to be in invariant under flow where the coordinates are moving linear, are mo evolving linearly. Because I pointed out the model problem, angles move linearly. So we'd like angles to move linearly, and we have to, and, and to be invariant under flow says I map a point, and then I flow, it's like taking, mapping the point, and then flowing in the phase space. Angles evolve linearly, that, and, and what do we have to find? We have to find S, and you have to find omega. Of course, that's an innocent equation, but if I differentiate in time, I can read the left side and the right side, it says s dot is equal to omega dot a gradient, and the right-hand side says s dot is in the direction of the Hamiltonian vector field, and I make I equate those two, and this is, this is a, what you have to solve for KM theory. So KM torus says solve six, for your embedding of a torus, your mapping of a torus, and omega. And in general, it's a small divisor problem. I actually, just for uh, reasons of functional analysis, you might say, take the inverse, and now this is a, 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 that's a Hermitian equation. Just nice, nice. Usually, such things involve Nash Moser iteration. Uh, let me, for instructional purposes, take the linearization and look at the tangent space, appro space approximation. So S is the real mapping I want to do, but suppose I make an approximate mapping and I want to correct it. I need to have a delta S equal, equal Z, and I need to know which direction to move Z in order to, in order to correct that to be a more true uh, embedding. And so I need to solve the linearization. That sounds like the, the, the Newton method. I need to solve the linearization at my previous embedding for right-hand side, which is the error. And this linearization is hard because this depends on S, but if I set S equal to zero, we're back to my original problem. These are the frequencies. So set S equal to zero, and let's see what we have. The, the eigenvalues of this problem, mapping a torus, which depends on S as well, or a PDE, and solving it for F, involve these eigenvalues. And now, I need just do the algebra. Now, it's a plus and a minus. Positive number, positive number, and positive numbers in the square root. So the plus is not dangerous. The minus is dangerous. Positive, minus, positive. Those generally accumulate at zero one. So those are the those are the famous small dividers. Uh, here's a connection with Anderson localization. I don't even just do this by analogy. In a Fourier basis on the torus, the operator I'm talking about, the one I just wrote down, looks like an infinite matrix of two by two block diagonals plus an off diagonal term off-diagonal term has some reality condition, and also from the nature of the problem, and because it's a PDE, it's a triplet, it's infinite triplet matrix. So if S is an approximate smooth embedding, it has very rapid off-diagonal uh, detail. Compare that situation where we, to one where you usually can associate Anderson localization. H is a parameterized by V, which is a diagonal operator, depending on V, these are the diagonal elements, plus epsilon t, where t is an off-diagonal uh, operator with very rapid off-diagonal 
decay. In fact, it's zero on the just the off diagonal. It's, that's what it, uh, that's what a Jacobi, ma a Jacobi matrix is. That's what the that's is the Laplacian. And the question is, is there localization for small epsilon? And the question is, and the answer is, it depends on the diagonal of V. And so the story in Anderson localization is if V is selected among a, 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 an ensemble, a random ensemble, most of the time it's non-resonant, meaning close to resonant wells are widely spaced apart. And froelich spencer theory shows you you have localization. It turns out with, with Gene, and then taken up by all sorts of people, including Gauguin, uh, serious papers by Berti and Ball, even more papers by the, in, by the, by the large and growing Italian school, I'm happy to report full of young people, those are the dot, dot, dot. Um, this is being studied. And, uh, if, if, and it's analogous to this, but it's different. And here are a, a, a family, a random family of potentials, those are parameters. And here, very few parameters, just amazing. But it turns out it's able to be done in many cases. Okay, let me change variables just to finish. Which is, remember we're mapping the torus into phase space. And uh, I would like to know whether an invariant such mapping exists. And actually I'd like to know how many. Can I count multiplicity? So my, my thinking comes a, comes a little bit from the Weinstein-Moser theory of uh, of uh, periodic orbits near resonance is the resonant of the FMF center field. So we often talk about loop space, the space of mappings of a circle into our space of interest, and I'm going to map tori into the space of interest. And there should be a topology, they should have derivatives, it should be a more technical thing. We just sweep all that under the rug. So I'm going to take a mapping and I'm going to define an average action functionals I, it'll depend on the mapping. Half integral of the torus, the torus is the model torus, just the, uh, just the angles, S, J inverse, gradient of S with respect to theta, E theta. Why is it interesting? It's interesting because its variation is J inverse D theta of S. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think that's interesting, let's go back a couple slides. J inverse D theta, it's part of our operator. And that, and in fact, the I is a vector, I bar is a vector, it's the moment map, but it's actually not the moment map for the, for the, for the actual dynamical system, it's the moment map for mapping. Okay, you can do that. Average Hamiltonian, you take H, you put in the embedding, because you need a point in phase space, you evaluate on H, you average over the, over the, over the independent variable, that's H bar. Why is it interesting? Because its variation is the gradient by Z of H. And then I have to go back two slides, actually three. There it is. It's part of our equation. So let me read the equation again. Consider a subset of chi, the bedding, embeddings, defined, embeddings of a torus defined by fixed actions. So MA, I'm going to set the first action, I bar, first average action is equal to A1, etc. The M average action is equal to AM. It's some subset possibly smooth, it depends on I, of that space of embedding. Here's the variational problem. Critical points of the average Hamiltonian on this variety correspond to solutions of my equation, mm -hmm. and the Lagrange requires the frequency. Simple. Just have to find those frequencies. It's kind of a general, so it's not really, as far as I know, a meaningful direct method, but nonetheless it's appealing. It's an appealing thought. Note, H bar is invariant <coughs> under a group action, actually the action of a torus. So are their IJ, so, 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 so is MA. They're all invariant under the change of origin, and you think you're cheating, but it actually gives you information. It's, 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 you think it's kind of trivial, but it actually gives you information. So, questions. Do critical points exist on MA? That's why we're doing Nash Moser, because it's, it's degenerate, and at least over Cantor families, we can find some aspect of the critical points. It's pretty degenerate, these, uh, these functionals. And then the second question is, how to understand multiplicity? So Nash Moser and KAM type methods to understand the first and do the analysis. And then I like to think of some elements of Morse Bach theory to count. It's an appealing, an appealing thought. So I need to do an example. 
because otherwise it's a little too vague. So let's go back to a line. Quadratic Hamiltonian, which we solved that separation of variables, and I told, told you we kill, our, we kill the brains of our students by doing this too much. So we'll try to do it a little bit, just a little bit more. Average Hamilton, the, the Hamiltonian, frequency is little omega, they depend on k, there are infinitely many k's, we have a Fourier transform. I want to linearize the equations, not for the flow, but for an invariant torus. So I have S of theta, theta is now varying over an m torus. I showed you the theorem for m equal 1, but we're working on the higher end case. And that's this, omega dot d theta of x is equal to the y gradient of h2. h2 because I'm doing this, this is the linearized example. Omega dot d theta of y is equal to the minus gradient with respect to x of e, which is this, we've seen it before. Fourier's representation, representation of the torus mapping. You take coordinates in phase space, you just take the basis of Hilbert space, and you have coefficients which depend on the, on the theta, but it's not fair to Fourier transform in, K, in, in, in S without Fourier transforming in theta. So do them both, and we have coefficients S, J, K. The equation for S, J, K will be a matrix. At least the linear equation for S, J, K will be an infinite matrix equation. I can value the same as before. Now, we'll find the null space. That's the solution of the linearized equation by choosing frequencies such that the big frequencies solve resonance relations here. And you can choose them m, m many, and the minus is the dangerous one. So you set the data from one to zero. This identifies a null eigenspace of, in the space of mappings. Remember, we're working not in Hilbert space, but the space of mappings in the Hilbert space. Null eigenspace, and the proposition is, ah, it's even dimensional. The non-resonant case is if the dimension of the null space, 2m, is equal to the number of uh, angles you have, well, 2m, and the resonant case of m is bigger. Lyapunov to Schmidt decomposition, this is following, following Lyapunov. Lyapunov decom Schmidt decomposition of the equation, null space equations, orthogonal null space equations, and decompose the mapping. Null space, orthogonal null space. And now we have to solve S2 for a function of S1 on omega. This is a standard thing, except it's for the a small divisor problem. And you solve, but you have to solve over, only over a canter set. That's the hard part, one, the hard analytic part. But let's, let's wave a magic wand and pretend we can do it, and let's see what, what we can conclude after that. <coughs> okay, it remains to solve the Q equation. It remains to solve the compatibility condition, which allows you to conclude that solutions exist. And what I'm saying is, it can also be posed variationally, like my formal argument from before. So, I'll define, but only on functional of the null space, null space and a variety in the null space. Average action is the average action of this partial, this is approximate solution of the P equation. Average Hamiltonian of the P equation. A variety in the null space which is you set these reduced average actions to values and you can get a, you get a, you get a variety. And the statement is, and it's like Moser's version, Moser's lemma in his paper on the Weinstein-Moser theory is, critical points of H bar one on M one are solutions of nine with action vector A. And again, they're all, everything's invariant with respect to the torus action. Group torus leaves it invariant, uh, it leaves a variety, the constraint variety of, uh, invariant, and it leaves H1 invariant. So every time we find a critical point, we find a critical orbit. And so how many critical orbits exist? And the answer is depending on the topology. That's the more, you know, that's how this topic lives. The more topology, the more you expect. So the conjecture, which seemed completely, I mean, I, I prefer being Instead of being complicated, I prefer being naive about this. So conjecture is, uh, you do some examples and you make a decision. So my, my conjecture, which, uh, okay, I'll tell you about it, but my conjecture is, there exists integers P1 through Pm, m be, little m being the number of frequencies, the number of angles you're, uh, that are in play, such that the sum of P is with big M, and that constraint variety is a product of odd dimensional circles whose dimension is given by the p's, 2p, j minus 1. Is it a reasonable, is it a reasonable guess? Well, let's try some examples. Okay, 
Periodic orbits, little m equal 1, but resonant case, big M, greater than 1. One constraint, they tend to be positive and definite, that's part of the hypothesis. So one constraint, it looks quadratic for small epsilon. It's definitely the constraint manifold is an odd dimensional sphere whose, uh, whose, whose uh, quotient by a torus is possibly weighted complex projective space, and number of critical points is greater than or equal to m, and that's the one that you know So it's a sphere. So my conjecture is true if little m is 1. Now let's make m bi big M big, but little m equal to big M. That's the non-resonant case for higher m. Then it's a torus. So m1 is a product, m many circles. That's a torus, that's an m torus. And if I mod out by the group action, I generally get a point, maybe several points, if it's in there. Okay, so those correspond, if they're full dimensional, KM tori, and, it's, and the variational principle I, I espoused was now Percival's variational principle. Here, it's Moser's variational principle. So let's do a couple other cases just to convince that the, that the conjecture is, is, is reasonable. Um, let's make M equal 2, but less than or equal to, how about less than big M to make it interesting? It occurs when you're looking at doubly periodic traveling wave patterns on the surface of water, and then the constraint set is a Sphere cross a sphere, both odd dimensional. Except, right, but you can't you can't predict p. P changes with a, and it's true that there's some varieties in a space where it's degenerate. And if you move across those, that's like a symplectic uh, surgery. But forget those a's and look at the others. It's always a pair of a, a product of two spheres. And then just by hand, if I have little m is less than big M only by one and you just do it by hand and draw pictures, at least that's my proof. This constraint set is mostly S1s, except it has one S3 factor. Okay, we're convinced that the conjecture is true, but of course, me talking about it means there's something wrong, and the conjecture is false. And I learned this from a 2006 paper by both John Mearsman, and that was pointed out by Mark Chaperon, to me by Mark Chaperon, who also has his own calculations, that there are some which are products of which are connected sums of, of products of spheres. So this could be a torus and then the connected sum of tori. You know, that looks like, uh, <coughs> like this. One torus, another torus, and then connected sum. So that's definitely not a product of spheres. Hmm, uh, already a problem. So, and then, and then the Bozio and Merzeman paper, it's an active paper, uh, just show that the conjecture is wrong, and they give examples where it is not true, and uh, and they all but there's no classification, and they say that the topology of a link is a hard problem. And I don't know other work, but maybe the topology now is might know more. I don't know more, but I'd be interested in learning about this. But it's hard for me to read their paper, and it's a big long paper, so please be gentle on me. But I'd like to know more. Okay, but in any case, uh, being naive. Uh, let's talk further. That means there's more topology. Well, shouldn't it be in general that more topology gives you more lower, bigger, lower bound on critical points? Well, the bad, sad part is it's not always the case, but it's kind of sort of a, a principle. It's kind of maybe true, maybe in some cases. So let me make a naive conjecture to add in the previous one, which is the number of critical points of h bar on this constraint set is bounded below by if it were true. And that's, that if it were true, that depends on all the p's, but this is a minimum number over all the p's for any random situation. So uh, that's where I stand today, and thank you very much for your time.
but it, it, but it's true. It also reduces from end filaments that can do anything. I mean, you really need these cracks. So it makes a constraint on end filaments to make them nice. Okay, so that's a very nice question. Answer. I have no idea. But it's very. It would be very interesting. <laughs> Uh, what is the dependence on A? Yeah. Uh, that is, you have to take A greater than zero, and they should be in a special set. Yeah. Right? As A moves, the frequencies become resonant. Mm. Yeah. And they become resonant and non-resonant, and it's a very complicated question. The limit of A? Uh, no, no, just for any A. For any A, yes. For any A, there are infinitely many resonances, mm. and they interact in a funny way, in a way which is a little bit out of control. So, well, a little bit in control. So if you have a bad A, you find it. And so for any for any epsilon, you can find a bad A. Say, say it this way, for any epsilon zero, you can find a bad A, and you would cut a little bit. And then you take the union as you take epsilon zero goes to zero, and you get omega back. But, you know, but it's still probably uh, you know, more than countable number of points you have excelled. It's typical parameter dependence of uh, a KDM theory. It's a series. And does it make sense uh, to consider the Sibali forces? Um, a certain amount of structure would vanish if there were a dissipative force, including the fact that a vortex filament would be on a core and only a core. So, the question of a vortex filament existing from Nugget Phillips, for example, is um, is analyzed, and it does exist, but for finite time. And the time goes to zero as the vortex goes to zero. So what happens is the vortex core would be smooth. I mean, you can even put not smooth cutoff nipple data and immediately for time positive, not time negative. Time positive, I can go time negative for oil, but time positive. But <coughs> positive, yes, it will immediately become smooth. And then after a certain time, you don't know. But you can keep a coherent structure for a fixed time. So, but certain things get screwed up. For example, immediately vorticity everywhere. Small, small amounts. Like the heat equation. I can put in compactness of our initial data, but instantly heat everywhere. So, a bunch of things get screwed up. But it's, it's, it's important, so it has been said. Maybe even more, or at least many more progress have been made on such basic questions. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Just on the last part of the topological side of your conjecture, and this is a very naive remark, is that when you think about uh, most theory that usually requires a non-degeneracy of the critical points. Yeah. And so maybe this the fact that you know, what you guessed uh, <coughs> was not true is because of some non-degeneracy of the critical some degeneracy of the critical points. Probably the example of the uh, chaperon and so on, it might involve some degeneracy. On the other hand you can use the you should have a cleaner one type of ideas in which you relax. It's independent yeah. on that number. <coughs> yeah. Actually, if which you is in the look-up length, for example, of a TN. Yeah. Instead. So actually, in the Moser-Weinstein theory, if you assume a more, if you come upon a more function, you get more solution. Ah, even more. So this is, is the new ah, it, 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 it is. It is the new yeah. yeah. And uh, And my minimum thing also is the new Knew more, oops, yeah. then a wave then. If we knew, but another wave showed up. <laughs> if we knew more, we would have a better, we would have a better, yeah. better outcome actually. So my basic question is that all of those are independent of the topology. Mm -hmm. It's just like saying, do we have a Morse functional on a on a link with that topology? And the link of the topology is this question. So I have a question for you, which is, <laughs> which when you, when you do these. Somewhat half global, because you have to do a whole chorus, mm -hmm. but partially local, mm -hmm. 
for small perturbations of action, mm -hmm. small. Uh, there's, um, what do I want to say? You, you, you are taking a variational problems of a functional which is invariant under the group action. Mm -hmm. But it's not any function. It's, for example, it's only a, a, a resonant, uh, resonant a family of resonant polynomials over the space of Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in this case, you would have only, <coughs> only cubic terms of the cubic and resonant. Mm -hmm. And that family is much lower dimensional than the space of all possible morse mm -hmm. And the count can be more. Mm -hmm. But how do I quantify it? Mm -hmm. I, I asked my uh, algebraic geometry friends, and they thought I was bad. <laughs> they didn't even think it was an interesting question, but I think it's an interesting question. So, so let's do the examples in our, in our head. Well, it's a little hard, but if you look at the one, two resonance, that's, the, that's just a two degree freedom system, but it's a resonance system. And Moser Weinstein tells you if you have two degrees of freedom, two critical points, you get three. And there's a degeneracy in the space of that, such polynomials on which you get infinitely many. Okay, let's do the next one, one, two resonance. Sim next simplest problem. Three degrees of freedom. Moser, Moser uh, Weinstein tells you it should be three periodic orbits. There are five. There are five, except on certain certain degeneracies where you can net infinite families. How do I start making this count? I don't even know what the subject is called. It's not more theory. That's any function. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a little complicated one. We can discuss it. Could be a quotient, but now I'm getting really in deep water. I don't know what it's called. So, I'll throw the question. How do I study this? Not all functions, special functions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any questions, comments? If you want to take <laughs>